it is wonderful to be surrounded by what I know is going to be a global conversation about where the money flow is going right now. But we're talking startups, we're talking, we have a startup in the house, even though it's pretty fully fledged one. We've got people who've consistently operated, consistently invested in, and indeed helped found. I'm interested, the question of this panel was, where's the next billion dollar company? And Jack, I would have thought most people would say AI right now, right? AI is certainly a very du jour topic, that's for sure. <laughs> but is it rightly so? Do you think ultimately, startups that are building within the ecosystem will be able to make headway when we've got already open AI teaming with Microsoft, Google's Bard, really big companies putting a lot of investment and been doing it for decades. I actually, um, I'm not sure to be honest, because I think there is a bottleneck of human capital. And so there are only so many PhDs uh, that are qualified to build out kind of the next generation AI. So I think it's going to be dominated uh, by the large companies like Microsoft, Google, OpenAI, uh, and I don't think it's going to be the domain of the, the feisty startups, necessarily. Marcelo, you've been thinking about how artificial intelligence is, I'm sure, going to disrupt portfolio companies that you've been invest investing in over the years, but also where within regionally the ecosystem is going to be built. Will there be AI flourishing everywhere? Will it be the home of West Coast? Will it be the home of developed nations? Will you see it in Latin America? Yes. Yeah, so I think there's a lot of hope for AI, especially in a dying region like San Francisco. <laughs> a lot of people are saying, oh. <laughs> well, we'll save San Francisco will be AI. And that's a big topic. I mean, that's a big belief. And I do believe that, you know, AI is going to be prevalent everywhere. It gives you the ability. However, it's all about talent. Mm. And what it, one of the things that I find fascinating is at one point in time, if you go back in the last couple of years, people were really saying that China had taken the lead on AI. And that's the creation of some fascinating companies like TikTok and others, which are true, the, the true, I would say, companies that have a spread AI. What is fascinating is through Gen AI, suddenly the, UA, the US again takes the lead mm. on a global basis, which is great uh, if, you know, if you happen to live in the US. Now, as it relates to where do you find the next billion dollar company, I think they're going to be worth a lot more than a billion dollars. And innovation disruption will happen, in my opinion, at the app level at the application level. Sure, there's gonna be foundational layers like there is today. Today you have operating systems, you have Android, you have Apple, you have so many different operating systems, but the disruption and innovation at each, at each business or each vertical, to me is gonna happen at application level that are gonna to have to plug in into these foundational layers. And you're really starting to see that some specialized companies. Now, it's, and I'll, I'll leave you with this comment. We were also concerned about valuation the last two years. How in the world did we invest in these valuations, but it's happening all over again. You know, the valuations that you're seeing in AI companies today are, you know, high, people are scared of missing out, and it's like it's happening all over again at a smaller space, a smaller scale than what happened in tech. So fascinating times ahead with, you know, AI showing our fingertips today. Pierre, are you being pushed to show the prowess of your own artificial intelligence already? You must be using it to understand the credit worthiness of the people that you help have access to finance across Argentina, Mexico, Colombia. But are you worried about the disruption it might have on your business? No, I think it's fantastic. I think it helps us. It helps us in three main ways. The first one is to drastically increase the productivity of our best developers. So development has always been an area where uh, the best rewards go to the best coders. Mm -hmm. And so this widens the gap between a good developer and a great developer. And so our tech team estimates that it makes the best 30, 40% more productive. And so if it helps the mediocre ones be 20% more productive, the gulf between them increases. That's number one. The second one is um, customer service. We worked for over six months with Salesforce, which is a big partner of ours, to build uh, a conversational bot that helps users. It already takes care of 40% of our flow. Wow. And we get contacted more than a million times every month. And so if you take 40% of that, it means more time for the people to actually deal with the difficult problems, which in financial services are a lot. And the third issue is the credit worthiness point. We develop our own uh, credit score for every user we have, because in our markets, over 50% of people are unbanked. So there is no credit scoring for them. So we build it directly with our own transactional data, with our own bill payment, with our own cell phone top-ups. And so we use information from your water bill or your electricity bill to build your credit profile. Um, Obviously, that requires an amount, an amount of data that would be impossible for anyone to, to deal with themselves, so our data team uses AI tools. And I think 
that you can have a lot of that innovation in centers just like you have cloud infrastructure in centers in the US or in China. So you have AWS and you have Azure in the main markets. And then in emerging markets, you are good just to connect to an API. We don't need to reinvent yeah. the wheel. We need to use those services and they need to be priced and, and made available in the kind of infrastructure that then benefits companies all over the world and including emerging markets. Yeah. Where is your talent right now? You just talked about how much more effective it's going to make your talent. Where are your best developers? So we have, we have people in over 10 countries. We have 17 nationalities in the team, even though we just operate three countries today, which means that we're planning to launch new markets. And we specialize in those places of the world where over 50% of adults have never had a card. Mm -hmm. And yet they want to pay for Netflix. They want to pay for Spotify. And we build all the financial services from credit to merchant acquiring based on that insight that everybody needs a digital account. And so we have people all over the place in new markets for us, but also in, in geographies that you wouldn't think. And so we have a lot of people in Eastern Europe. Uh, we have a lot of people in, um, in Asia. And then we have most of our talent in Argentina, where I'm from. So 80% of our developers are there. You have an amazing quality uh, given price in that market. And we increasingly have more people also in Colombia, which is a, a very fast developing market when it terms to tech talent. Jack. I feel that that speaks to something that you're thinking of perhaps a little bit more locally. And Marcelo goes there with the sort of, hey, who's in the West Coast? But it's interesting. You've been investing in an idea of democratization of talent or at least entrepreneurial talent across the US. Is it outside of the West Coast now more broadly? Well, Marcelo already touched on it. Um, and it's just, uh, just a point of view. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a, I'm a California refugee myself <laughs> uh, when we sold PayPal back in 2002. Uh, I moved out of the onerous regime uh, and moved to Arizona. And so my point of view on this is that the pandemic has accelerated uh, essentially the democratization of technology uh, more broadly across the United States, which I think is great. And so if you're a startup founder, if you're a serial entrepreneur and you've made money for a VC on Sand Hill Road, you can basically throw a dart at the map and move out of your shoebox house in Palo Alto or Menlo Park, wherever it is, and you can literally get 5X the house in Scottsdale, Park City, literally wherever the dark, dark may land. And the great thing about how kind of capitalism and venture capital in particular works is that that Sand Hill VC will come find you. Mm. And so that's happening uh, in real time right now. And I would argue, again, not to California bash, but uh, I think it's you know, top of the first inning in terms of that exodus leaving the state. And it's, you know, it's the fifth largest country in the world uh, by economic standards, and it has a long way to go in terms of this unravel, I think, potentially. I mean, Marcelo has... Bolivian, who then immediately have moved abroad, who's then thought about Miami as home, but always servicing and looking back to Latin America. Make it even more global for us. Who is investing in the VCs right now? Who's wanting to put money to work in tech funds and in investors? Is it largely coming from places in the world like the Middle East right now? So again, we, we're moving at an accelerated pace, and it's fascinating for me to see this guy on the left <laughs> who would have never come to the Middle East to go raise capital. And what you're saying is entrepreneurs today are bypassing, in many cases, your traditional venture and trying to come directly and raise money from mm -hmm. sovereigns. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Which means it raises the bar to private equity and to venture capital that is just more than just capital. And I am a big believer that just passive capital, deployment of capital, what happened the last 10 years, because if you're a venture capitalist in the last few years, you know, you were selling access to a company. Mm. So people work hard, hey, let's see if the founder likes me in order for me to get access. I think that's gone. I think the real investors of the future are going to be investors that can actually change the trajectory of a business, that can help entrepreneurs operate a scale, exit, hire, through all those things. And if all you're looking is for a less active capital, more passive capital, you're going to find the great companies coming directly to the Middle East, be Qatar, be UAE or be Saudi, because the teams that sovereigns are building are first class. Mm -hmm. And you have real talent coming and working for these sovereign funds, because most of the capital is coming from this part of the world today. Marcelo, give your learnings, though, because many would say where you were before and the Vision Fund in particular sort of upended the world of VC. To have that amount of money writing those large checks. In hindsight now, what would you give advice to the sovereign wealth funds, those eyeing up companies like Pierre's, to be like, okay, here's a recipe for a, for a good valuation, for the right amount of check with operating expertise that I can offer you. Yeah. 
So we came, so there was a time, let's call it prior to the time we're living today, that it was a perfect storm. Unlimited amount of capital, not only from SoftBank, but I mean, the, the, the amount of capital that venture capitals were raising were outrageous at a zero cost. So unlimited capital with zero interest rates or free money. Of course, that's going to force people to be very competitive in deals, and entrepreneurs were the big winners. A lot of lessons learned, growth at all costs, not a good thing. Mm -hmm. It was easy to invest because when the cost of money was zero, every company could turn profitable and generate positive cash flow in a PowerPoint presentation. Today, the world has changed. You have interest rates, you know, your, ba your lowest interest rate has gone up by 5% which means a lot of the business that would have been profitable business no longer are going to be profitable. So the stakes are way higher today. You know, us as investors, we're looking at businesses that are profitable or at least have a clear path to profitability and more importantly, a clear path to generating cash flow as we become growth equity investors. Mm -hmm. Nothing has changed in the seed world, in the Series A and all that. You know, you're betting behind a great entrepreneur who's going to figure out how they're going to overcome the obstacles to go build a great business. But as we get towards growth equity, you know, everybody's looking for a clear path to profitability. Let's talk about those obstacles, because Pierre, I'm pretty sure you're thoughtful about regulation being one of, I mean, boy, have they dialed up the regulatory switch over in the United States. I'm sure any crypto founder in particular would tell you that, but AI too at the moment. <laughs> I'm, I'm interested in what you're, what you're seeing in terms of where Who's leading the regulatory discussion now? Where do you have to look to to set the bar? Because Dubai and the Middle East are really thinking thoughtfully about crypto regulation, for example. So I, I, I operate in the world of, of financial inclusion, right? So we're trying to target these markets where, as I said, 50% of adults have never had access to financial services. And so what we find going around the world, and we've now acquired or built banks from scratch in all of our markets. So we bought banks in, in Argentina and in Mexico and built a bank in Colombia and we're building banks elsewhere. And we find regulators that are very open to the idea that everybody should be included. Why? Because operating in cash is, is expensive, it's difficult, and it doesn't protect you in a moment of inflation and like other panels were saying, you know, cost of living crisis. Mm -hmm. So every regulator wants people to have access to financial services. And we have, with technology, the ability to have delivery mechanisms that are far cheaper, far faster, and far more equitable than having branches. However, you find the temptation of regulatory capture by the incumbents that don't want that competition. Yep. They're fine making good money, and in times of higher rates, some businesses, including banks, don't suffer from what Marcelo is saying because the net interest margins are much better. <laughs> and so they're making more money, not less. And so they lobby the regulators to say, oh my God, fintechs are painful, fintechs are dangerous, the crypto players are dangerous. And of course, there's a lot of that. And so I think that currently, I, th I would say India and Brazil in my uh, space are the ones who are leading with the idea that opening up means more competition, which means more innovation, and that's the spirit of capitalism. And so PIX in Brazil has been a revolution because it gave instant payments to hundreds of millions of people instantly. And so what we see in Latin America is Mexico wanting to go after that, Argentina wanting to emulate that, there's, for the first time, an opening up of the Chilean banking system, which had been historically extremely closed. And yet, these companies need capital. And when I visit this region and I look at the amount of unbanked people in the Middle East, particularly in markets like Saudi and Egypt, what I see is a regulator that wants to open up, but thus far there hasn't been uh, local players that have had the unique combination of talent plus capital plus the regulatory expertise to get those licenses to be able to operate. And I think over the next 10 years, basically there's not going to be any more unbanked people in the world. So the question is, who's yes. gonna be able to lead that revolution from the markets where we've seen a lot of development into the markets where we have not yet seen a revolution? I mean, Jack, it's where you started. PayPal, you yeah. were pushing ahead in the world of fintech. 20 years ago. Yeah, from an early days. Ago. And look, there's still <laughs> PayPal. There's the PayPal mafia. There's also a firm. By now, pay later, now catching people's interest. Do you think regulatory capture is ever an issue? Do you think ultimately in the US at least, regulators are now understanding that they need to get ahead when it comes to technology and innovation like they seem to be trying with AI? It's an interesting question. Um, 
I was in the region a couple of years ago talking with, uh, I was at a dinner with some entrepreneurs uh, that were working in the financial technology space. And so when we were doing PayPal, there's always this question, do you ask for permission or do you ask for forgiveness? And in the US, we definitely were asking for forgiveness. We towed the line, we went across the line over and over again, and it ultimately worked out. We certainly had many, many near-death experiences as a company, but ultimately we succeeded by luck and, and, and some skill. Um, but I think uh, in this region, as an example, um, that doesn't work. So especially in, with financial institutions, because you're playing with people's money. You're not selling Beanie Babies, like in an eBay context. And so if you screw up someone's money, that gets regulators' attention very quickly. And so asking for permission, I think, is the better route forward. So it's really a cultural difference, I think, more than anything else. It's, it's interesting, and I, and I want to just want to go to the audience to get a bit of participation going, because we were just talking about valuations. We were just talking about VC and, and money being allocated. I wanted to get your opinion on whether you think perhaps valuations have eroded enough. Maybe we've resettled when it comes to public markets and now private markets. The valuations look acceptable for the rate of growth that we're seeing. Of course, this is case by case case, but go broad for me for a moment. So just have a little look, get on your apps and ask me whether the worst is over for startup valuations. Yes, we corrected. No, there's no, there is more pain to come. Otherwise, is only AI attractive? And Marcelo, to that point, when you're thinking about perhaps ways and means that you can play, can see the disparities from one region to another, you seem to... Obviously, there's a homing instinct from where you're from to want to go back to Latin America, but it feels like no matter what you feel, Latin America is a place to be allocating money because ultimately it's under, under allocated too. Why, why has it been? Why has it been overlooked? So I love Latin America, and uh, when we were with SoftBank, it bothered me that we were deploying a significant amount of capital and not a single dollar went to Latin America. So I. I went on a road trip to understand why. And there was a tremendous lack of capital in a region that has the size, you know, Latin America has close to 650 million people, has an income per capita that is 2x or 3x of what is India, and had all the means to basically be a great market for, uh, for startups or for te technology companies. But the main part was that there was a lack of capital. And Latin America has the ability to produce some amazing companies, to me, without uh, getting my friend to the left a little upset, you know, mm -hmm. Nubank is the world's best digital bank, bar none. Profitable, growing, tens of millions of customers, solving a big problem. Mm -hmm. You have iFood, where in Brazil, it's probably one of the best food delivery or super app companies in the world. Mm -hmm. And I can go on and on about some amazing companies that, are, that have been founded in Latin America, including Pierre Paolo's company, Voila. So it was, a, it was a place in the world where there was not enough capital. It has the size, and once you put capital, then you start to see some business thriving. Uh, we also had the lowest amount of venture capital as a percentage of GDP. Mm. I mean, Latin America, when, when I got there, the total venture was one and a half billion dollars, where the rest of the world was... I mean, Sorry, it was one and a half billion. One and a half totally. billion dollars. Wow. Then by the time we were done, it was 16 billion dollars a year. So we've equalized Latin America to the rest of the world and we've helped create some of the world's most amazing companies. So I have a lot of faith in Latin America, and we're gonna to continue to invest there because people are scared. And you know, we like to be in a place where there's less competition. And I'll finish by saying that in my opinion, Latin America remains today the place where there's significant more opportunities than capital available. And that's a good place to be. It's interesting that you filled that capital gap here by going to China. Tencent, your biggest investor. How do you, see the allocation of capital perhaps changing as trade tensions arise, as we see a more ultimately deglobalized world right now? Is there opportunity because allocation of capital is being disrupted? So there's a great story today uh, in the press about how China has been increasing its investment in Latin America, taking advantage, of course, of the same flows that Marcelo was describing. We see that opportunity. Tencent's been an amazing investor. They're our largest investor, but we always took a non-traditional path precisely because Latin America was, was underfunded. And so I lived for 12 years in the United States and when I went back home to Argentina to start this business, um, I wasn't funded by traditional venture capital but by, rather by Soros and then Goldman Sachs, which emulates a little bit of what happened with the first wave of technology companies coming out of Latin America, including Mercado Libre and Globant, 
that were not backed by the traditional VC players that were way too focused on SaaS businesses in Menlo Park. Mm. And so um, this desire to have uh, new sources of growth. Latin America, like the GCC, is a region where there's a lot of young people and a middle class that is expanding every year. And so you have m from food delivery to financial services uh, and to deliveries of the other goods and e-commerce in general, the opportunity is huge and you have a growing market, which is not the same as other places. And so we see a lot of interest, not just from China, but from Japan, from Europe, and from American investors now trying to get into these markets where you have very positive trends. And what we also see is that in a world of, of deglobalization or a second Cold War, a lot of investors are extremely careful with some regulatory thresholds. And that is obviously understandable because some of the regulators might raise eyebrows if uh, foreign investors, especially in financial services, but I'm sure it's the same in AI, if some investor from abroad owns more than, say, 10 or 20%. And in the Basel rules, especially for financial institutions, there are these thresholds where people have to report in a different way, and especially if they're public companies. So I think we're going to see a lot more of that, which then creates an opportunity for people or for institutions that have more freedom, have more freedom to invest regionally, have more freedom to play in different industries, and finally, that they have the ability to do different types of capital structure. And a lot of the traditional VCs don't have that ability. And so that's how we see more direct investment from sovereign wealth funds, from other tech companies from other places, and from non-traditional providers of capital. Jack, how do you see the deglobalized world offering opportunities? Because a lot of hand-wringing goes on about the so-called races, US versus China. I know a lot of the venture capitalists in particularly the Valley are worried about China versus US. Mm. Is it something that you think about that has changed your ultimate outlook or the way in which you run your business? Has it disrupted it, the, the means of operation at all? So um, one of our board members from back during the PayPal days was Mike Moritz from Sequoia. And he wrote uh, an editorial in the Wall Street Journal probably six or seven years ago, uh, basically trying to ring the bell in alarm Silicon Valley, uh, which otherwise basically had its head in the sand with respect to China. And I think Silicon Valley is good at many things, uh, but viewing the world on a macro level, Silicon Valley has never been very good at. And so uh, that's something I think uh, we can all do quite a bit better at, um, but I do, do not think it's a strength of what Silicon Valley does. Marcelo, you're working with a company that was born in China, but Singapore headquartered now, but you're helping access manufacturing for Sheen, which is one of the most, most fast growing, do we even call it a startup now, but a certain fashion tech company. How do you see, ultimately, that's an opportunity for you, right? Maybe that certain US allocators aren't going to be putting money to it, but you're really seeing how they, you can aid them to get into the, to, to Latin America, to onshore in that way. Yeah. So Shane is a perfect example of, a, of an entrepreneur who saw China as a competitive advantage as a manufacturing site. And in no time, built one of the world's fastest growing companies in terms of growth, in terms of size, shipping products from China to over 165 different countries to hundreds of millions of customers who are making their apparel decisions based on a complete different way of manufacturing. Mm -hmm. That was phase one. Phase two is the globalization of Sheen. And what you see is we've announced 2,000 new factories, 100,000 people in Brazil. Last week, we announced the opening of hundreds of factories in, in Mexico to serve the U.S. market. We announced Turkey to serve the European market, and we just announced India to serve the Indian market. And that is just, it's fascinating to see what is going on as it relates to the deglobalization of the world and how countries actually ask you to be closer to the customers and to be able to set manufacturing facilities. Now, the beauty is how do you translate that manufacturing knowledge of China and you transfer to other parts of the world? And it's a fascinating mm. exercise that we're going through in a company that's incredibly high growth and that's totally disrupting, you know, a, an industry that was already disrupted by companies like Serra or H&M or Uniqlo, who are now being disrupted by a new total digital disruptor. I'll try not to be too negative as we wind this up because we've run out of time, but is the worst over for startup valuations? No, there is more pain to come, 70%. <laughs> so quick fire round, does that mean more opportunities for you, Jack? Well, first of all, happy birthday. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Final <laughs> work. <laughs> <laughs>
Buzz on my parents. <laughs> we won't sing. We won't sing. Uh, I would absolutely agree with uh, the chart. Would you, do you think you want to write checks when there's more pain to come? I think the three are correct. There's opportunities in AI. Some companies have corrected, right? And there is some that still got to go through pain. And it just, but again, never to be confused. Innovation, disruption, technology growth has not stopped. What has stopped is valuations, and that is because the cost of money has changed. And it's logical, it's obvious. I mean, if, mo if money is going to cost you more, valuations are going to be lower. So I don't know why everybody's so surprised. And technology is still going to continue to disrupt. And I think, to even be more bold, I think the next five years, the level of innovation and disruption that we're going to see through the true introduction of AI into our lives is bigger than what we've lived for the last 200 years. Mm. Yeah, and you're going to be innovating and building? Yeah, I think, I think this is going to create opportunities for the ones who are there because they're going to face less competition. And so when we talk to our investors, what we hear is, who else is going to get $300, $400 million to build what you've built, to go get the licenses that you get? And so this, what's going to create is a lot more winners of the big companies that are either have gone public or will go public over the next two years. And there, the key is to be able to present a path to profitability. And you know, in our case, we're going to be profitable in our biggest market this year, to be able to show that gives you opportunities with investors who are already part of the cap table or new ones, and there's a lot of interest. But I think there's a lot of pain in the companies that are small that have not yet achieved yeah. scale. And that is fundamentally a problem because we might lose some great disruptors that where, where this money being more expensive caught them at the Series A or Series C at a time when no one else is there to do those rounds. I'm going to now insist they sing me happy birthday behind closed doors. But thank you all very much for spending some time with us. What an amazing panel. I thank you, Jack, Marcelo, Pierre. Thank a you. wonderful, thoughtful conversation. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Thank you.